I'm becoming a provincialist, which is that I, I, one of the things I go against now is this assumption that the future mean futurism means urbanization, ever greater density of people living in high rise accommodation. Okay. And first of all, it's not necessary. Okay. I live in Kent. Um, the population of Kent is 1.8 million. Okay. Population of Essex is 1.8 million. There you have, you know, half the London population living to a great extent. Okay, there's the Medway towns as cultures to South End, Canterbury, but effectively living in a rural or semi-rural idyll. Okay. Um, uh, and there's, you know, there's room for another million people in Kent without us even noticing if you built if you built a new town somewhere. So first of all, I don't think the agglomeration is necessary. Secondly, I think what we've done is we've looked at gains to agglomeration in terms of economic growth without looking at the downside which is that high property prices eventually mean I, 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 okay I was in an extreme case okay and I've got a really good case because you might have been to the food festival in Abergavenny I don't know if you have or haven't. heard of it it's yeah very revered but uh, Abergavenny is seen as this absolute culinary mecca okay now when I was okay I grew up eight miles from Abergavenny if you'd suggested to anybody in 1979 that Abergavenny would be seen as a culinary mecca, they would have laughed their heads off, OK? Because, you know, there was Vin Sullivan, who was one... And there were a couple of high-end food shops, as you'd expect, in a town of kind of 15, 15 16,000 people. But the idea that it would be seen as kind of almost emblematic of all that is good in British food would have seemed comical. In fairness to, in fairness to the Tafts, and I am one... Uh, you know, the raw materials have always been good in Wales, so I'll, I'll defend them on those grounds, I think. You know, basic vegetables, you know, meat have been pretty good. Um, but the extent to which now I'm, I'm actually more excited, in a way, going to, well, at the top of the, you know, top end, it'd be Manchester, Newcastle, Liverpool. I'm more excited shifting out new restaurant ideas in Folkestone, okay, than I am in London is, I think, emblematic of that issue where actually really high property prices uh, act, are a massive drag on innovation. You heard of, like Margate is now becoming a, a hub for food. Margate's have it going through that process where, and I went down there, there's a restaurant called Angelina's. Uh, Jay Rayner goes down there quite a lot, actually, because I think there's a lot of good, loads of good restaurants, but it's a prime example of, of where you don't have to be in London, and it, and it, it's all about the context. Well, I'll, give, I'll give you three. I'll give you three in in, in Folkestone, okay? Which is um, uh, there's a fantastic place called Pick Up Pinchos, run by a guy who spent quite a lot of time learning the craft in San Sebastian. Uh, there is Annapurna, which is a Nepalese restaurant. There's a Gurkha regiment, I think, historically nearby, which is one of the best Indian restaurants and possibly the best value Indian restaurant I've ever been to sensationally good um there's obviously rock salt um down on the harbour front which is you know posher but again astounding okay uh, there's not you know and also you know london has an awful lot of replication I mean, how many branches of pizza express do you want you know you know an awful lot of london scale just leads to replication it doesn't lead to diversity at all but but where i'm trying to i suppose go to this is lots lots of our listeners will think they need national distribution in a a Waitrose or a Co-op or a Sainsbury's, if if you're a premium brand like like our chili oil, for example, but what 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 I think is interesting is is context changes, um, it c can can change geographically as well. So, for example, you may think, oh, I need to be in a in a Waitrose store in Sheffield, for example, or or a Sainsbury's in Sheffield. Well, actually, the context of being in a Sainsbury store in Sheffield, the, the shopper there won't want to spend money on a premium chili oil. But if you go to a very... You'd be surprised. Uh, you'd be surprised. But, it's but, worth but, noting but, that but because you... they're up north, they've got a bit more... They spend less money on property. Cars are better up north. But, you know... I mean, genuinely, the quality of motors is, you know, you go to Newcastle... They've got a better, you know, Londoners have shit cars or don't have cars at all. Yeah, bicycles. Um, but, but, so, you know, we, yeah. Oh, sorry, what I, was, what I was trying to say is, but if you go for, for our listeners, but, but in ev all of these new cities that are come up and coming, there's always going to be like an avant garde coffee shop yes. or an avant garde, um, uh, I don't know, these kind of 
quasi mini whole food come convenience uh if you've seen them uh it's basically hip it's hipsters, hipsters yes yeah, basically attack yeah, is what i'm trying to say I, I, i'm country. totally i'm massively pro hipster yeah, it's, I think it's hipsterism. Worth... Hipsterism is the solution to the environmental crisis. It's the solution to, um, you know, I, you know, we you know, we ridicule these people, but it's an extraordinarily valuable um, thing because it contributes towards place making. You don't need that much hipsterism to make a place a lot more livable. And actually, um, you know, let's not stereotype people because um, ordinary people like a bit of artisanship, right? They like a bit of variety. They like a bit of farmer's market, to, you know, alongside supermarket. Uh, it's it's very, very wrong to think that hipsters are only selling to other hipsters. For sure. And let me, let me explain. I, I'll make two very weird defences here, OK? Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, wrote a paper back in the 1960s asking why is the food in Britain so bad? It's a rich country, relatively, access to very good uh, raw materials. Why is the food so bad? And um, uh, uh, and Krugman's thesis was that it was simply because after rationing and World War II and a whole variety of other things, the British had not really experienced really good food. Now, I, I dispute that because I think we did have really good food in the shape of pies and other because we'd never really experienced, we didn't have a frame of reference, and therefore we were content with things far worse than we should have been. Um, that was Krugman's idea. Now, one valuable thing that hipsters do, you know, or is it expands your um, range of expectations upwards. Okay, so it raises your mental ceiling. The other organisations I'll defend as part of the ecosystem are chains. And I will die in the wall defending Starbucks, Costa Coffee, um, Travel Lodge, Premier Inn, uh, Holiday Inn Express, right? What do those organisations do in the overall ecosystem? They raise the floor, okay? They say, if you're going to operate in this space, you've got to be at least as good as us. Because otherwise you're going to fail. Now, uh, you're not old enough to have tried to have stayed in a British hotel in 1979 or 1981. Trust me, OK? Before Travelodge and IHG and all these people came along, the odds were your experience could be absolutely shit. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I remember the last of it, staying in a seafront hotel in Brighton. Now, if you've got a seafront hotel in Brighton, you've got a pretty good licence to run a good and this was a case where the double bed was actually two single beds that had been cobbled together. And when your feet stuck to the carpet as you walked along the corridor, OK, and that was in the kind of probably early 2000s. And the great thing about st everybody, <laughs> Starbucks. Starbucks is Starbucks is fantastic. OK, Costa's fantastic because it basically says, you know, this is table stakes now in the coffee world. And this is table stakes in the hotel world. Now you've got to try and beat us. Okay. Now, also, also, I'd add the detail among the, you know, the, the coffee connoisseurs who said, look, everybody slags off Starbucks, but if it weren't for Starbucks, I couldn't charge three pounds for it. Coffee. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, you know, and so the, the, the hipsters are great at raising the ceiling of expectations and the chains are great at raising the floor. And that makes, I suppose... <clears throat> That's if if I'm applying this through, through the through the lens of food and, food and drink. The one thing you don't want to do is buy a hipster sandwich when you've got a train to catch. By the way, oh. this is one of my this is one of my mischievous ideas, which is to launch a. Um, there used to be a barber's at Paddington Station, which is in occupying what used to be, I think, a, a public lavatory, and you went down a few flights of steps at Paddington, uh, not far from kind of platform ten. And they're these elderly Italian guys. Now, the one thing is they were used to cutting the hair of people who had a train to catch. And they were the fastest goddamn barbers you've ever come across in your life. <laughs> there wasn't any, what will you be doing this weekend, sir, and blah, blah, blah. It was bang, 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 bang. Bosh it out. <laughs> I, I, I've got an idea for a, a, um, a chain of, of station-based uh, coffee shops called Flat White or Fuck Off. <laughs> okay? And you, you get rid of all the choice and you just you just... Henry Ford produced flat whites. People come along, they tap their card, they pick up a coffee, they board the train, okay? And um, uh, because some of, you know, 
that you know, if you've got a train to catch, th th that delay, if, if the person in front of you asks for a complicated ice drink, is absolutely infuriating, and it means you can't commit to having a coffee because you don't know what the queue is going to be like. Okay, that's the one thing. 